We're going to be doing lots of coding examples, um, trying to dive a little bit deeper into some of the other things you do, some objects, um, and other things that you'll see around in the code. Starting with probably the most important, which is events. This is how everything works in Gym 5. So let's just dive straight in um, and start implementing an event. So um, let's make an object and what this or add to our hello object. What we're going to add to it um, is an event that after some latency fires and prints something. Uh, there's a chair here that you want to squeeze in. One there, another couple over here you might be able to squeeze into. So we're using that after some latency fire an event. Um, so let's edit our hello object file. Yeah. Can you also push that the hello object in the git repo? Because I didn't wrote it here while you were doing that. Maybe. Let's see what happens. Um, okay. Let's Uh, oh, the style checker failed. Look at me not using the right style. <laughs> um, of course, it doesn't let me do anything if my style is wrong. Line 46. Huh? Nice tutorial. Oh, it's. A, I think it should be able to. Oh. That also is wrong style, but it should be able to do This is a good point. I will take a moment and do this. fun to watch. Okay. Um, okay. How do I do this, Andreas? So you push it to your, so the remote is probably called, called origin. Yep. Um, but well, uh, well, it's, um, I want to push head. Yeah. Where, where do I push? So push. You want to push it for review, right? What? You want to push it for review, don't you? No, I want to push. I'm just pushing. So I'm just pushing. Just, just uh, name the branch in that case. So okay. HPC. Oh. So you need to patch your rebase. Rebase? Yeah, you might need to specify the remote branch, but it depends. Okay, so that, I, that that worked. Okay, so you guys can do git pull um, and pull down the, that change. And also a change that solves the problem building on Max. One of the problems building on Max. Okay, sorry. So now that you all have my code, um, let's modify, let's add, we're adding an event. Um, so, HPCA tutorial, hello object HH. Let's declare this event. Um, so we're going to add a private member. So first we're going to add a function that we want the event to call. We'll call it process event. Um, and this function, uh, it has to be void, return nothing, and take no parameters. Although, if you're here in the afternoon coding sprint, I think that there was a cool, easy way to make it where these functions can take parameters. So you can help us implement that. So then uh, we're going to use this event wrapper interface. So we're going to declare this event 
uh, using a bit wrapper, which makes it, well, we're going to simply call this function. Uh, often you'll see events that are much more complicated than this, but event wrapper is the easiest way to do it. It's a templatized function. So this variable, which we're calling event, is going to call this function, which is bound to this method, or, or bound to this instantiation of this object, um, which is a hello world object. Um, if you understand everything going on in that template expression, you know more C++ than I do. Uh, okay. So then we need to implement that function. So void hello object process. We're just going to simply print something right now. So, great, we have this event, and we have something that's going to call, but now we have to schedule the event, somehow get the event on the event queue. So to do that, we are going to um, override a special function um, called startup. This function is called right when you call m5.simulate. When you call m5.simulate, this is the time that all the objects are allowed to start scheduling things on the event queue um, that they want to schedule before they start simulating. So in this case, we're going to call startup, and we are going to simply schedule, schedule the event. Um, and why don't we schedule it for tick 100? Um, and two other little things we need to do. We need to pass a reference to this, to that event, so we know what um, object the event is bound to. Um, yeah. And then uh, declare startup in our header file as well. Sorry for going back and forth. So this um, schedule, we're going to schedule this event that is declared in the header file at tick 100. So if we go back to the header file, we also have to make sure we put startup in here. And we're overriding it. Questions? The override is not strictly necessary, but it's good coding practice. First time I didn't do a typo. Okay, so now if we run it. Hello, run. We see both at tick zero, it prints out this hello world, and then tick 100, it processes the event. Cool. So that worked. Got questions on that? Ah, let's make it a little bit more complicated then. Um, <coughs> so let's add a couple parameters here. Let's add a latency and Let's fire this event some number of times with some latency between each fire. That's what we're going to try to do. So we're going to add these two um, members to this class. Then in our C file, we 
we need to give them the fonts. So let's do it 10 times by default. So now instead of scheduling event for 100, let's schedule it to occur at latency time. And then in process event, let's add how many times we have to do this left, which is right at our character limit. So let's subtract one whenever we process the event. Um, and if times left is zero, we just say we're done. Else, We'll reschedule the event. And this time we're going to schedule the event um, relative. Relative to whatever the current ticket is, we're going to schedule the event for a latency later. So this parameter to schedule is always a absolute tick value. Um, there are some convenience functions to make that a little bit easier. If you inherit from clocked object, you get to use the cycle count uh, to schedule events at certain cycles. Mm -hmm. So what's the relationship between clock and tick? So a tick is um, a configurable, that's the minimum latent, or the, the minimum time step to impact a tick is a tick. Um, it is usually a picosecond or running at a terahertz, um, but it is configurable. So if you needed to run something at a terahertz, you would have to configure that tick to be uh, short. So if you want to schedule an event, say, 4,000 cycles, like, you need to inherit the clock object? Yeah, so if you inherit from clocked objects, you have a clock. Uh -huh. If you schedule for four cycles later, um, I think definitely in the book I have an example that does that. Um, I don't think I'm going to go over it today. Um, yeah, in the book I have something that is a clocked object, and you can call um, cycles of two, and that'll do two cycles later. And it just automatically converts it from cycles to text. For you. Any other questions? Oh, that's pretty simple. Um, okay, so again, rebuild and run. So see, while this is rebuilding, this is the perfect time to answer, ask questions. I have nothing else to do except stare at this as it runs. At least it's on a relatively fast computer. Um, all right, so if we run again, we get exactly what we expect. It takes now a nanosecond since it's ticking once every 100 picoseconds. Questions? So one of the key things here is that events can schedule other events. Um, and that's where you get these complex interactions between objects. You might have your CPU sends a message to the cache, which enqueues an event, which then later will send a message across the crossbar, which will enqueue an event to later send something out the other side of the port, et cetera. Uh, okay, so if we jump back over here. Um, so this, like I said, this event wrapper is a convenience wrapper around it um, for simple events that don't take any parameters. I do think we can make this a little bit better. Um, you can also inherit, make a new class that inherits from an event that then allows you to uh, save information and do much more complicated process functions, which we will not look at. But I have some examples up in the book. Um, and then the startup, again, is called after everything's instantiated, right before you start simulating. 
Um, on the wiki, there's it discusses all the different functions that they get called. You have like constructors, init, init state, and then startup. They get called as some objects come up from Python. Um, let's see, I think I said this. It's an absolute tick is what schedule uses. Um, and cur tick is really useful for telling you what the current tick is. Um, it's used all over the place. Okay. Questions? Right. Okay, so adding parameters to some objects. This is another important thing that you're going to see all over the place. So here, we just set these to some numbers. But what if you wanted that configurable from Python instead of setting it to specific numbers? So to do this, we're going to edit the um, some object description file. So hello object.py. So here, before we imported params and port star and then didn't really use anything there. So now we're going to use some, say, I'm going to call a variable time to wait. I'm going to wait some amount of time between every time we fire. So I'm going to set, I'm going to make this a latency parameter. Um, And then you can write whatever you want for the description of what this um, parameter is. So this um, text is some description of the parameter. And another one, number of times we're going to fire. It's an integer. Let's default to 1. And Makes sense. Um, there's a lot of really powerful parameters. So this parameter about latency allows us to say things like one nanosecond, and that's automatically converted to text for us. Um, there's other things like memory size, which allows you to write things like one kilobyte, and that's automatically converted into bytes. Um, <coughs> memory bandwidth, um, which I have an example of using memory bandwidth in the book that I'm not going to go over today, but that allows you to do things like 10 gigabytes per second, and that's converted into bytes per tick, so you can just multiply. Um, it's really useful, these parameters. All right, so now that we've declared them, um, we can use them here. So I'm going to format this a little bit differently. So instead of doing this, we can access this parameter from this params object. I called it time to wait. So whatever you called the parameter in the semoptic description file, this params has that parameter. Um, similarly with times left, I called it uh, number of So this is how you get param add parameters to some objects, and how you get information from the Python world into the C++ world. So with that, we can recompile again. Questions? I need to come up. Yes. There are some limited ways you can add arrays for params. So um, within the Python wrapper, you can specify a vector param, and that's generally how you do it. And you can use that for pretty much any parameter type, so integers or sim objects, or time or floating point, or whatever. Accessing those vector params, I don't think it's as straightforward as indexing them in the C++. But there are a bunch of examples yeah. um, in the code where you can see how that works. Yeah. Are they passed into this this is a dot file. Are they? Okay. You assign it as a Python list and it shows up in C++ as a heel. Okay. Cool. Um, 
Okay, so now we run it. Oh, I got an error. Fatal, hello JSON, time to wait without default or user value set. So I didn't specify a default value in my um, sim object description file, so that means in the Python configuration file, I have to specify something there. So we can edit that, configs, HPCA, um, hello run, and now we can specify time to wait equals, uh, let's go with two microseconds. So since this is a latency, we can specify it in terms of time, and it's automatically converted for us to ticks. Um, so we can run this. Now we run, and it fires once, and it took two microseconds. You could also edit this, Oop. edit it, and do something like root dot hello json is dot uh, what did I call it? Number of fires. Number of fires equals three. Um, so when you're setting these parameters, you can either set them in the um, when you're calling the constructor, or at least what it seems like in Python calling the constructor, or you can set um, the member variables. And you can change this as much as you want until you call info instantiate. Then you can't change it anymore. So now we run, it goes three times with two microseconds of between. Questions? Um, okay, cool. So, let's see. I guess I didn't mention this. Um, when you're specifying parameters, it's always param dot something, and then that type. Uh, there are lots of types. Um, including all the normal types like integers, unsigned integers, floats, etc. <coughs> um, the first value is the default value, and the second value is apparently I didn't finish doing the slide. The second one is the uh, a description of it. Um, try to have good descriptions so people understand what your parameters are, which I think you'll find as you look through Jimbox's code. Not everyone does that. So going further in the book, um, which I'm going to skip over this time, um, I do. I looked at other types of memory size and memory bandwidth. You can also have other sim objects as parameters, so you can connect sim. That's how you connect sim objects together. Um, so I have in uh, this chapter, I had a goodbye object which says goodbye, um, but you have to call a function from the hello object to get it to say goodbye. And so if you want. If you need a pointer to another sim object, you usually add a parameter to a sim object to get that point. Um, and so this shows how you do sim object sim object interaction. So if you want to look at that, I encourage you to go to the book. Um, okay. So any questions on that? Uh, how about the one the boundaries was on the on the runtime? Like at the command line? Yeah. So for that, you would um, just in your Python configuration script add parameters. So you can use like opt parse or arg parse and then in your script parse those arguments and then set it um, on your in the configuration script set the parameters in the sum objects. There's no automatic exporting of command line parameters. Anything else? Yeah? Uh, can you reuse the same event member to schedule multiple concurrent events? Or you need um, you need every point. event can only be on the event queue once. Okay. So, but you can use the same event. This was an event wrapper. Um, you could have created multiple new event wrappers, okay. like use new, create multiple ones on the heap, and then schedule multiple of those. But every you can only be on the event queue. each event instance can only be on the event queue once. You get a fatal if you try to do that. You can reschedule it after the event has been triggered. But yes, you can reschedule. You, for can't, you can't use the same event multiple times concurrently. That's true. Um, rescheduling is not great, though. It can't be a good practice to reschedule. <laughs> um, any other question? 